So, so, so we're really, we're doubly lucky that he can join us tonight for this lecture, and he's going to be with us tomorrow uh, for the jury here in the space on day two of this week, this year's uh, thesis design projects. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Mark back to the AA and to the DRL. We had him in briefly for a session uh, actually with this group a little over a year ago, I guess, uh, in the fall of last academic year. Mark, uh, of course, is a former uh, tutor here at the AA. Uh, and he's going to be presenting tonight uh, the work of Decoy, an office that Mark founded in 1991 with a number of collaborators, which from its very beginning, I think, and as much as any young office in the world today is interested and committed to the exploration of architecture in a, uh, we, we could call an expanded definition of technology and collaboration. Um, it has been a part of the impulse of Decoy from its very beginning in 1991 and has only grown steadily ever since. Uh, uh, in its collaboration beyond, I think, the normal sorts of definitions of the people that we work with as architects. Uh, Mark works with, for example, Dr. Alex Scott, a solid geometry mathematician, as a part of the work of Decoy, and Professor Mark Burry uh, in Australia, who's one of the world's leading parametric modeling experts. Their area of work specifically is uh, a kind of technical expertise that's very much tied not just to digital design and distributed design technologies, but the way and the role of architectural installations in relation to the technologies that guide and control them. Um, and the office very quickly established an international reputation with that technical expertise. They've worked with Ove Arup here in London, uh, with Rice Francis Ritchie in Paris, and of course with Foster and Partners uh, here in London. Uh, Decoy has, been, has received a number of awards internationally, including uh, awards from the Royal Academy here in London, from the from uh, the French Cultural Ministry. Uh, recently, Decoy represented the Republic of France at the Venice Biennale uh, and participated in a 50-year commemoration of the United Nations in Paris uh, a few years ago. Recently, they had a 10-year survey of their work at the Frac Center in Paris as a part of Arsha Lab, uh, and in 2001 received the pre prestigious International uh, Digital Design Award by FIDAD uh, in 2001. Mark has, since leaving the AA in 94-95, uh, gone on to teach at Castle University for a couple of years um, in Barcelona and is currently in negotiation for teaching in the United States at MIT, which should begin quite soon. Not next week, but in the next few days. Yeah. Um, um, recently, Decoy has completed a number of uh, uh, residential projects in Paris and London. Um, and in addition to that, in 1998, worked with Foster and Partners providing technical design studies as a part of the Gateshead uh, Regional Arts Center, which I'm sure you all know. Um, in 2002, they worked with the British Council for an exhibition, uh, and in 2000, completed uh, a project which you all have probably seen online called the Aegis Hyposurface, which grew out of a competition a few years ago, which I think as much as any of their projects in the last few years, few years has pointed to uh, a paradigm of the deep kind of integration between operating systems, architecture, um, mechanical systems behind them, um, which so integrates all of them together in studying the possibilities for behavior within the mechanical and physical models of architecture that it's just become a kind of landmark, I think, of contemporary architectural design. Uh, and I think Mark is at a stage now where he's very much working through such issues as um, intellectual property rights associated with those sorts of things, um, the role that's played in the pioneering of these systems. And I think in that way is taking the sort of issues um, that are circling around architecture and not treating them as a theme or a topic to reflect on and pursuing a traditional kind of practice, but literally working through the, some of the material realities of what they mean today. Uh, in how architects work. Please join me in welcoming Mark Gothard. Thank you very much, Brett. It's, it's not simply my birthday, it's a particularly uh, momentous birthday, um, which makes me the saddest 40-year-old <laughs> or the most committed. <laughs> um, now, because it's my birthday, I can do what I want. Uh, and, and because it's such a, a, a fulcrum point, uh, I thought I should speculate somewhat. And what I, um, what I thought in coming across on the train this morning was, was I mean, typically there's, there's, there's two or three different ways you can present architecture. One is the, the architectural chat where you just uh, go project by project and say this is what we did. 
which is easiest to give and easiest to receive in many ways. Um, and then I think there's, um, there's other forms of presentation which try to be much more specific about what it is that you're, you're working on. Um, and the, the period that we're in se seems to be one of, uh, obviously, a, 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 it's a period of technical assimilation. And so I think there's a necessary sort of technical component to, to any uh, more, more focused presentation. Um, but my particular interest is, is, uh, is to balance that against you know, truly architectural concerns and not, not simply to develop a, a discourse of, of techno-rationalism. Um, so what I thought I'd try and do today w would be to give a chat, just to, to go through actually six projects, six fairly recent projects, um, in a fairly casual way, but then to weave across that um, excerpts from, uh, from two texts that I've... Uh, uh, I've prepared fairly recently. One, one is the, the uh, catalogue of the Venice Biennale, which attempted a sort of uh, speculative um, uh, discourse about how digital systems and, and contextualism uh, might, might develop. Uh, and that's quite technical, but quite precise uh, uh, text. And then to balance that against uh, a curious essay that I was asked to write on, on Bachelard's Poetics of Space. Um, where, in fact, I took the work of John Fraser, uh, the, the work from the late 80s and early 90s, the speculative digital work of John Fraser, and I sort of read it through Bachelard, which sounds like a very strange thing to do, but Bachelard strikes me as a, a, a fascinating, I mean, he increasingly, increasingly fascinates me, as a thinker who emerged from scientific rationalism. He was, he was the philosopher of, of, of science. Um, and then two books marked a sort of startling change to his career, The Poetics of Space and The Psychoanalysis of Fire, and they, they completely startled all his colleagues in that he, he effectively turned back against scientific rationalism and said the most essential uh, things to talk about uh, in philosophy uh, is, is the, the, the creative moment, how the, the uh, image, the, the, uh, by image he means the, the moment at which cultural norms are burst. Uh, what are the conditions that make that possible? What's the creative impulse that makes that possible? And, and how does that then rip through culture and change, change cultural imagination. Uh, so effectively, The Poetics of Space is a book about uh, creativity and what it takes to, to, to generate it. And he was, he was not convinced, uh, ultimately, that scientific rationalism could either comprehend those moments or propitiate them. And so he developed his phenomenological uh, discourse. Now, I'm, not, I'm certainly not proposing a return to phenomenology, far from it. Um, but he's a very interesting writer, uh, writing in the 1950s, which was a period of very rapid technological um, uh, sort of uptake. Uh, and he uh, developed it almost, almost as a, a defense mechanism against a, tr a, a, a too rapid scientification of culture. And I think we're in a similar sort of period as, as the digital technologies come in. And we're too fascinated simply by the, 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 the uh, scientific rational aspects of, of this device. Um, now he's, the book is about space, but it's, it's not about space. It's about how writers, poets, have used spatial images, spatial metaphors to, to propel their creative thinking. Um, so what you're going to get today, if it works, and it doesn't matter if it doesn't because it's my birthday, um, is, is sort of terse little paragraphs from, from the, uh, the, the essay on, uh, from the Biennale catalog, uh, and then occasional sort of drifty paragraphs from my reverie on Bachelard and John Fraser, um, and our work as well. So, concentrate. Um, f first is from the from from the, uh, the the introduction to the Biennale catalogue, which simply says, "Decoy is engaged in requalifying a broad range of inherited assumptions of architectural production, in light of the shift to a digital medium, from the inception of a project, the creative process, uh, to its modelling through to fabrication. We've undertaken a range of experimental initiatives." will explore the various potentials of the new medium. We use the term potentials, uh, mindful that unless one produces elegant architectural possibilities, and by that I mean efficient as well as aesthetic, then such efforts are unlikely to alter current architectural norms. Whether working algorithmically, parametrically, or programmatically, which seem to be the three effective modes uh, offered to architects in computer-based processes, we've looked for elegance in all phases of production, most crucially in the final built work. In so doing, we've recognized the need to deploy a range of technical skills, which has encouraged an interdisciplinary and collective creative endeavor, decoy increasingly structured as a loose network of digital affiliates. And I'm delighted. I think Mark Burry's uh, probably going to slink in at the back. Um, 
the Professor of Innovation at RMIT, uh, <coughs> Alex Scott, mathematician from UCL around the corner, um, and David Glover and Ed Clark from Overup, uh, structural engineers. I think they're all here today, and that, uh, they're so crucial to, to much of this work. So to Bachelard, in, in many of Decoy's projects, we are indeed looking to express not so much an architecture as the possibility of an architecture, a reverie as to a new digital condition. We deliberately develop multiple creative threads that weave into a final architectural form, frequently allowing the process to lead where it will to exceed in some manner our rational preconception. What would remain is for the onset of such images to be accounted for, the thinking of the digital itself, and it's here that we might expect a quite marked shift in creative manner if we are attentive to the impact of digital technologies. So, is that okay? Thank you. If we were to imagine a creative process that allowed us to link any input to any resultant effect, architects might develop an adequately explicit context machine. Architects have always dreamed of such machines or dreamed that they as architects are such machines, but have preferred to maintain such linkages as vague and implicit processes. The technologies architects have hitherto de deplo deployed in their creative processes have favored imprecise gestural linkages pencil and paper, inadequate media for relational modeling. Moreover, such determinate forms of inscription impel linearizing and non-reversible formal processes that once inscribed seemingly admit of no contextual play, no back and forth engagement or assessment of the architectural act. Contextual discourse is then suspiciously prior to the act of architecture. <coughs> Considered in light of digital technology, our imaginary context machine is not limited to the visual realm it is able to sample every aspect of an environment continually, all sensorial and even extrasensorial registers mon monitored temporarily. Indeed, time is introduced as an active contextual agent. Such context machine might seem fanciful were it not already in existence, a receptive digital network that encephalates the globe, requiring only linkage to the parametric propensity of, of computational systems. Henceforth, contextualism will be the explicit linkage of one set of quotients with another and the calibration of their alloplastic potential, the degree to which an el elastically linked model reciprocates a bodily presence and translates it into form. Okay, this uh, our first project, which was a, a competition for a gateway to the, the South Bank in London. Um, see if I can get back. The site between Waterloo Station and the... the um, the South Bank uh, walkway, so the, the, the Royal Festival Hall is just behind me, and that uh, passageway under the viaduct, the sort of link from Waterloo down to that cultural strip, is, is the site for a new gateway as the Houses of Parliament. Um, now, that, that whole area has been subject to renovation, and so the, the, the competition was to develop some sort, of, uh, some sort of adequate gateway to this important place. Now, the physical context uh, was less interesting to me than, than the, the dynamic, the dynamics of the space, the sound and movement through it. Uh, it's at the confluence of, of pedestrian, rail, and uh, traffic systems, and it's really the sound in that space, the sound of, of people moving, that is, it's its essential characteristic. So there it, it is. And that, and that uh, suggested that we work with the, the non-traditional sort of contextual um, notions, uh, sound and movement, and ask, asking whether we could begin to develop a design, not from a physical contextuality, but from its, uh, its dynamics. And what I found fascinating about this, the, the site was it was a zone, a zone in depth. It was about 70, 70 meters long. Um, and it made me think the Virilio's uh, comment that the last gateway to the city is the scanning device at airports. Um, but where, for me, that, that scanning device has already extended in depth throughout the city, and we're surrounded increasingly by, by a, a network of digital systems that, that monitor uh, and um, affect our behavior implicitly or explicitly, um, in increasingly so. Um, and the thought was, could you begin to, to use that um, sort of soft depth that's the, uh, of digital systems to begin to, to create a, a zone, and not a front door, back door, but actually a zone of interrogation? We poured fluids through it using dynamics of a sort of tendency of movement through the space, 
so coming from Waterloo up here, down through and sweeping off to the left to create this sort of second site, if you like. And we began to break this up with, uh, uh, with, with sound, so just playing sight sound back to this thing, creating this series of shells. This is a very typical kind of process that we're going through in developing many of these projects. I, I dwell on this one particularly. And I'm immediately beginning to think that it's, it's a zone through which people are passing, a series of shells that, that their movement is captured by various listening and looking devices and redeployed through these, uh, these evolving shells. Uh, and out of that process, which is neither sort of legitimate nor illegitimate, it's simply, simply a sampling process, um, begin to emerge these curious sort of forms, not designed as such, they're sort of <coughs> emerging from the process. Uh, and in fact, we, we ended with about 10 shells. Um, the, the, a large gateway at the, at the slow end of the site and a speeding exit at the end. And it began to generate some, some fairly compelling forms, but two, two things bothered me. One, I was back to this sort of front door, back door uh, thing, and also that the, the forms had no sort of implicit constraint and seemed very expensive, and the budget was, was very real and very low. And at a certain point, we just sort of dropped it all. We'd been through these uh, endless generative processes and stopped for an evening, and everyone was uh, depressed. And we came back in and, and just sketched in three dimensions, trying to remember what we'd learned from those, those various processes, and, and sort of developed this as a diagram. But it's, uh, it's a sort of slow archway that folds through that space as a continuous sort of vortex and, and moves off to the left. Uh, and from that diagram, very quickly, we developed the final form which I don't think, so there we go, uh, which ended as simply four, four surfaces. Um, their floors from, that's the floor twisting up into a wall, uh, wrapped across by a sort of decelerating, well that's the, the accelerating exit, and a decelerating sort of vortex at the, at the entrance. Uh, but at the same time, Mark Burry's team in Australia were, were trying to constrain this with a parametric model such that uh, it could be built with straight lines, so even though it looks highly complex, it's tightly controlled. And we imagined it built from tessellated strips of aluminium, all of them straight. Uh, and we actually turned up for the jury w with a fabricator uh, who pledged to do it for their budget of £200,000. Um, it didn't win as the competition, unfortunately. But So in, in the end, what we've sort of distilled out of this process is this, this curious um, uh, sort of listening device uh, through which commuters are passing continually and it's listening to them and looking at them and then redeploying their sound and, and movement back through the, uh, the structure. And that, uh, that idea of um, well, one, you're, you're, you're sort of capturing architecture out of this sampling process instead of determinately designing it seems to me a very powerful one. Uh, but then you're taking that sort of al alloplastic uh, reciprocity or something between into into physical architectural space and beginning to deploy a uh, beginning to develop a, a, a space that is dependent on people and it comes into being as much you know through the interaction of, of people as not. So the gateway to the, the South Bank developed as a, tra a trace of the non-physical aspects of the site, the evolutive mappings of the patterns of movement and sound in and around it. We deployed digital registration for such non-visual tracery, sampling and editing the open-ended processing that resulted. The resulting project is a vortex of four tessellated aluminium ribbons which fold languidly beneath the railway viaduct to create a fluid chamber that was to act as a, a site for light and sound sculpture triggered in response to activity within the gateway. It's a giant oral canal digitally attuned to the activities that take place within it and responding real time to changes in patterns of behavior. It deploys interactive digital systems to, to, to create a literal reciprocity between environment and self, a fully alloplastic malleability. From its formal genesis to its social reciprocity, the paramorph is tuned in relation to a full range of contextual constraints, be they budgetary or social. As an active context machine, the paramorph is harbinger of a greatly enhanced contextual potentiality released by digital systems, not simply of enhanced formal possibility in the precision of parametrically constrained geometric systems. Bachelard's reverie on shells perhaps provides a counterpoint where his interest to experience the image of the function of inhabiting may be contrasted with the simple will to shell form which he derides. 
For Bachelard, the mesmeric geometries of shells, their outer appearance, actually defeat the imagination. The created object itself is highly intelligible. It is the formation, not the form, that remains mysterious. The essential force of the shell being that it is, it is exuded from within, the secretion of an organism is not fabricated from without as an idealized form. The shell is left in the air blindly as the trace of a convulsive absence, a smooth and lustrous internal carapace, then exfoliating in depth in its exposure to the air, a temporal crustacean. Such inversion of ideological tendency, an expansive mental shell emptiness, Bachelard captures deliciously. The mollusk's motto, he says, would be, one must live to build one's house and not build one's house to live in. Such inversion of determinism, sort of capturing something from, from an internally generated process, would seem to be a recipe for a genetic architecture, that's phrases, on condition that its secretions are unselfconscious and felicitous. Now, this next project is the Blue Gallery, challenge to reimagine the neutral space of art. The Blue Gallery, let me get to another one. Ba, ba, ba. Sorry. Yeah, challenge to reimagine the neutral space of art. The Blue Gallery developed as an amorphous uh, shell. <laughs> as an amorphous interior carapace splitting and twisting around an existing column, as if all the perspectival lines of the ubiquitous white box had been dragged to earth. The shells were developed over time, stretching to fill the existing space, but wrapping as a continuous uh, parametric, pan panoramic surface of subtly sweeping curves. They were not rationalized or optimized other than to, to limit the curvature where paintings were to be floated. And frequently there are five-sided lofted elements which we found impossible within the parameters of the existing software. Just as the curves developed according to an open-ended exploratory process, so the shells materialized as a gradually hardening logic, subject to exploration throughout the process. The complex curved surfaces layered in, in tensile materiality, aluminium tube overlaid by twisted laths of aircraft ply, trapped a temporal quality, the diligence and material sensibility of the workers captured in the striated patterning in time and ground smooth prior to the application of a thin shell of fiberglass. It was as if the energy of fabrication had condensed into a form. So this uh, a fairly s simple and small project, um, nonetheless highly complex in that we're developing um, uh, truly complex curved shells, which means the curvature is changing in, in three dimensions. And it, it led us to having to develop uh, all the stru structural templates. So every piece of metal we had to carefully nest to, um, to, to uh, uh, avoid wastage of cutting. It was supposed to be cut by, by laser or by water jet, but in the end it was quicker and cheaper by hand. Um, our aluminium guardian angels, a company called Optikinetics in Luton, came in. Now we were intending to, to, to coat these shells in fiberglass uh, for strength. Uh, and the fiberglass would only be about two or three millimeters thick, so we were trying to get the steel or the aluminium to a, to a tolerance of about two or three millimeters. Um, which we, we seem fairly successfully to do, just from our, our drawings. They brought these into the, the gallery, and, and very, very quickly we found that uh, we were indeed sort of hitting uh, the sort of sorts of tolerances that we, we needed. And quite, quite quickly you could see that um, the, the complex curves in space, we, we bent these little strips of aluminium throughout the space, and you could see we were sort of hitting that, uh, uh, we're actually, actually getting that curvature. So we then coated it with lath supply. We thought we could do it with big rectangular sheets. Not at all. You cannot bend a rectangular sheet into uh, two dimensions, in three dimensions. So we end with these thin strips of aircraft ply, which just screwed back into this lattice of thin, thin aluminium strips. And it became quite a beautiful process. This, these uh, weird striated. Uh, shell forms that have emerged where the, the tension of the aluminium and the tension of the wood sort of balanced each other and pulled itself into a, a taut curvature. 
So then uh, a group of fiberglasses came in. They typically do cars and boats. And I, I really didn't have to give them any instruction. They came into that space, saw the lines. And they filled the whole surface in about three hours and ground it uh, one night. Um, and this, this sort of soft, soft shell thing emerged. Sorry, I just did that wrong. Uh, where you could, you could really see the diligence of the workers in the surface. And I just wanted to varnish it at that point, except it wasn't really structural. It's just a backdrop for the fiberglass, which is the structural bit, so we, we had to persevere. But um, quite quickly, this very, uh, very sensual, um, horizonless space emerged. It was the first moment that we began to qualify the specific quality of complex curves. And you see them deployed everywhere in architecture um, because we can model them in the computer. But they have a very particular quality, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in our next project. But you could run your finger down that. It was absolutely bump. It's the floating shell. Uh, so we'd essentially got, got that. It was then sprayed with fiberglass and rolled little mohair brushes, these little army of guys. Um, and slowly this thing emerged. Now that's pretty much the last photo we have, and as some of you will know. Uh, we had the opening, which seemed very successful. It wasn't complete, but it was, uh, it was close enough. And then uh, three days later, the, art the artists refused to put their work in it. And uh, it was demolished three days later. After a consider... <laughs> it, was it was the m largest amount of work for an opening night ever, I tell you. Bachelard dwells on the voluptuous inscrutability of the exposed inner shell which, born of an impalpable inner logic, provokes an imaginary dementia. Faced with the shell's indifferent beauty, poetic imagination involuntarily conjures endless series of grotesques, emergent forms that slide expansively in and out of the curvaceous yet inexpressive void. The shell seems to demand, that is, an appreciation of an impulsion, a force of egress, which is somehow trapped in the geology of the form, latent trauma. I have the sense, if only as a subtle shiver, in Bachelard's phenomenological lyricism, that the process of formation is left as a mental material residue that, that then bends imagination to its logic, which would be the fully cultural way that the poetic of such improbable forms. I arrived uh, halfway through demolition. Um, it was kept secret from us, essentially, and posed as a photographer with the idea that I could perhaps sell the, sell the photographs for more than my architectural fee, which remains my ambition. Now, this next, next project has allowed us to, to go much further in uh, beginning to explore how to sort of translate um, sort of non-standard and complex curved uh, you know, ideas into, into fabrication. And this is an apartment in, in Paris, which we're just, just coming to the end of, uh, which has gone on for probably two years or so. Um, and the client first came to me. He'd already had two architects, and they'd each worked on it for a year. And he'd, uh, he'd, he'd dismissed them, just frustrated. And by the time he came to me, he, he, uh, he said, um, what I, don't, I don't want design. You know, I don't want Philips type basins. I don't want lights designed in, in, in Denmark or something. I just want architecture. You know, can, you, can you give it to me? Something, something savage and noble. Um, and I kind of said, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, as you do. The, bu the building is 1960s. It's very, very fine, but very understated building. I thought that was interesting from the outset um, by Carpentier, who got the Prix de Rome in the 1960s. The 1960s building, that's the, the front of the apartment, overlooking Jardin de Luxembourg. Uh, the rear of the apartment, he, he's, that's the, the main apartment that he'd lived in for two or three years. And he's acquired this downstairs. He's got three children, and they wanted to connect uh, to, to, to make this the children's uh, layer, and then the garden. Um, <coughs> he didn't give me any, I mean, the existing building is, uh, I think it's great, it's very strong, simple detailing. Uh, the apartment was okay, with interesting furniture, fantastic photography collection. He's got Gersey, he's got everything. Uh, he's got a, a wonderful film producer. Um, but he'd, um, he just said, you know, give me raw materiality. Um, and we reorganized the apartment quite considerably. 
but very constrained because it's this low 1960s space, so formally not much opportunity for gymnastics, but uh, before there was a corridor down the centre and then four little rooms. We, we changed that, we made that the master bedroom, <coughs> which goes from the back, the back garden on this side to a courtyard on that side, and we put the bathroom in it. There's a little hammam, which is where the uh, sort of recovered space. That's his dressing room, this is her dressing room. The kitchen we flip to the back so that it can spill out to the, the garden. Dining, living, uh, television come guest room, uh, small guest bathroom. And this landlocked space we, we turned into a, a gallery for his, his photographs. And then we cut a stair down here, which is extremely tight, um, to a lower level, which is fairly simple. Three, we, it's, it's semi-basement, so it was really dark and, and dismal, so we opened it up to create one big space. And then I had to then put the children in, in small sort of cells. Um, uh, but but I, think, I think that was a good move because it, it pulls light in. Now, from the outset, we started working. He wanted to work with mass, nothing lightweight, no varnish, no paint. Uh, he just wanted raw materiality. So we, we set about um, casting concrete, which was perhaps the most stupid thing I've ever done in my life, in an existing building in Paris. Um, because we, we, we ended up casting them on site because everything is non-standard and not straight. Um, and so these big slabs of 550 kilos were being maneuvered through this space with all the neighbors going crazy. Uh, it was supposed to take, they, they pledged it would take uh, s uh, 12 weeks. It took a year at the end. Um, <laughs> and that gives you sort of just, just some idea of casting it slab by slab. Now, because it was cast um, slab by slab, we, we began to syncopate all the rhythms. So every slab is sort of celebrated as being somewhat different. And that's an idea that's taken hold. And even though um, the He's, he's after sort of minimalism. Uh, if everything becomes a, a sort of syncopated rhythm. So that just uh, the downstairs space, which is sort of opened up. Now the the only really interesting bit downstairs is the staircase. Um, now that back to my little Biennale text, the Haddad apartment staircase evidences the parametric propensity of digital systems and the explicit variance permitted by contextual variance. Here, the simple parameters of a flight of stairs are embedded in a relational geometric model. Height of tread, length of tread, angle of tread, depth of nosing, angle of nosing. We've then modulated the parameters according to the local conditions, allowing that the treads inflect to suit the constrained space, and that the <coughs> requirements of the foot be allowed to exert influence on the concrete mass. As the foot and ankle are twisted on the oblique treads at the top of the stair, so the angle of the nosing is increased uh, to allow the foot comfort. Since all the treads are globally constrained, so this gives a serial deformation across the entire flight and a corresponding heave to the dense materiality. The formwork information automatically follows the parametric variance. The powerfully plastic deformation that results is a delicious side effect of such a process, as if the very materiality of architecture was suddenly malleable in its relationship to bodily gesture. Most poignant, though, is the fact that this is not simply a stare. It's every stare. So they're the formworks. We're just generating. So each one is, is not center. We're casting everything upside down and flipping it so you get the bell fast, as they say. And then maneuvering these uh, big planks up through this space. So at the top, it's a solid prism. At the bottom, it's a sort of floating plane. It moves through that. And it's, it's great. It's because the only image he'd shown me was a, a John Pawson staircase, just a, a straight flight. Um, and, and we sort of seized that. And, and, and just deformed it with this, this globally constrained logic. Um, now underneath that stair, just to, to block the underside of the stair, we've, we've uh, put a deformed niche in, which is one of only two complex curves. We've done it with this traditional Parisian plaster. They have uh, staff, which is a, uh, they use for cornices and things like that. But we, we got a fantastic staffer. And I said, you know, can you do a complex curve if I give you information every 30 centimeters. And he said, well, I'll give it a go. And so he said about this thing. And again, this very curious, uh, I put a child in there, so decoy architecture does not frighten children. But um, it's, it, what's astonishing is, is that as you come into that space, it's almost a vertigine. You can't sense the limit of, the, of this, this curious little niche. It's highly fun. And again, that sort of tells me something about the specific qualities of complex curves. Uh, now, the other complex curve is behind the master bed, bed head, which is here. And again, a very, very tight space. So I've, I've um, 
uh, opened it out with a complex curve, and it, it sort of slips. The, the bed is on one leg for reasons that have um, been speculated about on the, on the building site, but it, it drags the whole wall with it. So our, our drawings, are every 30 centimeters, we're giving them things. Um, perfectly built in this, in this wonderful material. It's just a sort of seamless. And it really, it swells the whole space open. He, he was terrified that the curves would cramp the space, but quite the contrary. It comes this sort of depthless, uh, you almost can't see the limit of it in cert certain angles. And then that, that material became used th throughout, but we were able to do all sorts of things. Be because he has these big photographs of um, uh, Gursky and things, uh, he asked for an invisible light source that would be completely even over the whole surface. I'm like, yeah, all right, thanks. Um, we also weren't using paint, we were just waxing that surface. So I didn't want to use halogens, which in any case would give little spots uh, because they're hot and they, we can't repaint the ceiling to get rid of the, uh, the stains. So we developed this light from scratch using optic fiber, which is cold, and bunching uh, five heads into this plaster molding. Um, so that's a little, so there's the, there's the optic fiber. So the, the heat source is elsewhere in a cupboard and the, the light comes down these, uh, these plastic fibers. And there, then, the, the, the thing. And what's, what's curious, we I hadn't really anticipated what effect it would give, and it's very discreet, but the photo doesn't capture it, but it's like a little baby Tyrell. Uh, and it just floats. It's sort of, you, you, you can't get where the light's coming from. It's very curious. And you can see the, the, uh, the light is sort of multi-directional. There's five, five heads. Um, took about five months to develop that damn thing. But, well, I mean, astonishing. Now, there's the wax, uh, waxed. Stucco, which just drags in light. Um, that central gallery space, we were going to do the, the doors in wood, but it wasn't essential enough for him. So we ended up casting, we put a steel frame in there and then cast that in fibrous plaster as well. So these doors were coming in at about 350 kilos, so it's a nine-man lift, this door. Uh, but it's, it's, it's so beautiful, it's got, it's got such a mass when you open it. And we've um, taken all the light switches into the door handles, so it's a sort of mouse as you enter. So we had to hollow the pivots, etc. Uh, all the on this floor of, of the apartment, everything has been fabricated. Every light switch, every door handle, every base, and every bath, and that sort of idea of non-standardisation, you know, from the striated patterns, just takes hold, and we begin to um, to sort of gather momentum, uh, as as you'll see, and every component gets. And so even the floors become a striated wood. Now he hated red wood, he hated yellow wood, he only likes grey wood. And searching for grey wood um, is extremely difficult. We found this bete, which is an African wood, ebony, uh, which is extraordinary stuff. And then this, which is, uh, this is a thing called Shendamare, which uh, is actually about 2,000 years old. And you find it when you're digging up gravel in the Danube and things, occasionally a log comes up and the tannin in the water has, has penetrated the wood and begun to stain it black. And we had three trees, so I, I chopped them again into striated patterns. And it's almost like charcoal, and it's, it's extraordinary stuff, and the way it catches the light. <coughs> so it's half fossilized. So all the cupboards on the upper floor became this wood. And it's really, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, extremely subtle. And if in France, you, you do get great craftsmanship, so you've, you've still got very, very good carpenters. Um, and throughout the apartment, it's just, it's just cleaved. Uh, huge slabs of cleaved slates. Um, all the tapware we've stripped off the modernist chrome and patinaed the, 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 the brass. So you're taking everything back to this raw materiality. So the split cobbles and that chandemarie. <coughs> cleaved slate and white glass. But So the material, there's a sort of background materiality, that's the hammam with uh, again, optic fiber lighting. But it's, it's really when we get into components, and it was, uh, so we, that wall was in ebony. Um, and then it was how to make fireplace and basins. And we'd done a, a bronze casting of the Blue Gallery as a sort of memorial for the Venice Biennale. Uh, so I suggested we use bronze. And he loved it. He said, wow, fantastic. And so so we, we set about designing every component as, as a, a casting. So this, again, again just creeping this deformation in, into an essentially uh, minimalist vocabulary, so you, you're just tweaking these off. Um, having to work with engineers, the bronze guy, and a CNC machining guy, and understand all those logics. I think just this piece probably took two, two man months in the office. So you're going from that as the, the great 
uh, you're machining it in polyurethane and then casting it in bronze. Oh, that, that's actually in uh, cast iron. So there, there the rest of it in polystyrene, so that's machined directly with the CNC machine, and cast in sand and resin. And this was just tremendous. This is a raw fire. It was fantastic. Now, the, the pure uh, image on the computer, that's how it comes out, and it's probably retracted. I think this, this fireplace retracted five centimeters. So you're working to the millimeter, and then the thing comes out of the mold, and it's smoking hot, and it's just way off, and you have to deal with it. But uh, half a ton of, uh, of bronze, this is a four-meter four cantilever. Um, now, getting it into the apartment, we hadn't really thought about it. <laughs> um, so we stopped the traffic one day. Lu Lucas knows this one. <laughs> and there was, a, there, was a, there was a balancing problem, but the, the sculptor here, Greg Ryan, is very persuasive. <laughs> so in it goes. And saved, really, by the, uh, the, the, the fibrous plaster workers who could adapt to the, the geometries that weren't exact. Um, it comes in now. No one believes that it will work because the chimney wasn't big enough. They told me so. We set fire to some parquet, and you can see he's highly dubious. And it, it went like a like a storm. Um, and great, sort of between primeval and ultra modern somehow. Sorry about the quality of the photos. I just ran out. Of. That's it ultimately. So then uh, ev everything followed. Every basin we began to machine in. Uh, and it's, a, it's a really rough process. It's not the, the purity you'd imagine, but somehow I love that. And this one without a, uh, without a waste pipe, just to give you something to think about in the toilet. Uh, the, the light, there you see the sort of effect of that diffuse light. It, it gives this sort of uh, depth to everything, which is, is very curious. And they're slightly um, deproportioned doors, but it's, it's the lack of um, paint finish. It's a wax finish, and it gives it this curious spatial depth. So his dressing room with this, this dark wood. Her basin in bronze. Now it's the black bronze again. Uh, again, we stripped all the patina off everything. And then his basin, which is cast aluminium, um, against a uh, cleave black slate. Now the the most compelling piece was she. This was her her dressing area, and she complained that when she's got a culotte down, um, she feels a bit exposed. Now she can close doors here and here, but she asked if we could put a wall in so he could nip down to the bedroom without sort of seeing her. Uh, and I said, no, the space is too small, so I'll just hang a screen from the, from the ceiling and leave it, leave it up to me. And uh, I went to work with uh, Alex uh, Scott, the mathematician at UCL, and we developed this thing, which for me is really the key to the whole apartment. It's syncopated rhythm, uh, and then you're introducing deformation, and you're, you're, take, you're going straight from a creative machine to a milling machine, and then casting it. And we, we set about casting this thing to the limit of their kilns. They had... Uh, 260 kilos of aluminium they could get out of two kilns. Um, they, just to give you some idea, that the sand mold was 20 tons uh, to make this piece, and this horrible thing came out. <laughs> it, it was, and now the client got wind of it because we were being so nervous, and so he came out to the foundry just at this moment and said, what the fuck are you guys doing? Um, and we explained that we just cast 260 kilos of aluminium and it didn't look very good. And he said, he said, that's, that's solid aluminium. And I said, yeah, that's about five centimeters thick. And he just said, polish it. And so we set about polishing it. Took three days, this poor guy <laughs> polished it. And this thing emerged. It was astonishing. And it's really the quality of light that it captures. And what, I mean, what is really delicious in this whole project, I think, is, is the, uh, the notion that from these light and virtual digital systems, the materialization can be heavy and uh, fluid and dirty. Um. <laughs> you see the thickness of it. And it's the mass of the thing. The sculptor, Greg, keeps saying, uh, 
humans have got a, a, a sixth sense, which is um, which is mass, and it's true. You walk past this thing, it sort of resonates. Very curious. So you you begin to get a hint of sort of the uh, non-standard potentials that uh, digital you know, fabrication is, is beginning to introduce. The wife was a bit dubious at first, but she's uh, she's come around. And the, the bathtub, we <laughs> we said we were going to scan her derriere, and uh, she laughed until she realised we were serious. But again, that gives you some some idea of the difficulty of the thing, the whole thing split in the mould. Yep. So this next one was a very curious commission. We were asked by um, the mayor of a small town in the Perigord where they, they raise the ducks for foie gras. And it's a very sleepy community. And I think he, uh, there's a young and quite dynamic mayor and he uh, felt that his community was, was bored and launched this initiative to invite six artists in. And he split the community into old people, uh, shopkeepers, farmers, children, and we, there was a just direct meeting between an artist and he invited a poet, a landscape architect, an architect. I got the militant farmers that no one wanted to work with in this little hamlet out here. And we had a very curious meeting because they, essentially it's a, it's a, uh, it's a project that is not theirs, they don't want it, and there is no brief. And so I sort of came and said, what do you want? They sort of said, well, we, we don't. Um, <laughs> I said, well, I've got to do something. And they, they all shuffled around. So it's on this little, little, little crossroads. The only thing they'd talk about, the only thing I'd get out of them was the fact there's limestone caves underneath the site that they'd, they'd seen photos of but never visited. And uh, it, it sort of haunts their imagination. So and notionally I said, well, I'll create you a digital cave. Um, now this, again, we, we've, we've sort of used it as, a, as an opportunity to, uh, we, we frequently are using art, artworks to explore principles which, which then later come into architecture. And here, with no context, and normally we, we're overburdened by context here, there's really no context, no brief, no nothing, it's a folly, it's a, a thing, a shelter. And we began to think of it uh, as, as a primitive hut where you, you're trying to use digital systems to, to tug at the landscape and create the most minimal pocketing of space. Uh, and we sort of play around with a series of splines, which is sort of the base, base information of uh, computer modeling. And we tug it in relation to views, to uh, against the wind, uh, until something begins to sort of settle. But a very um, the, the simplest gesture. So, so ultimately, it's I think six splines. Uh, the difficulty of the complex curves of the previous project and the limited budget make, made me here begin to facet it, uh, and this thing slowly emerges. Now. Another fascination is moving architecture truly into three-dimensional space. But by that I mean that um, you're not uh, cr creating a complex surface and then putting a two-dimensional structure behind it. You're using the, the uh, articulation of that surface structurally uh, as best you can. And here it's, it's actually 16. We conceived it as 16 th three-dimensional trusses which are worked on you know, fully in three dimensions. Now, I took this back and presented it to them. Um, this is somewhere where they meet to go hunting or, or to water their horses. Um, <laughs> and uh, the only comment I got was, um, hunting for what? <laughs> uh, and there was a kind of stony silence. And finally, uh, I'd, I'd exhausted myself presenting it. Finally, I said, well, you know, are you with it or against it? With it, with it. <laughs> Uh, completely unanimous, which was a delightful contrast to the, uh, the artists of London. <laughs> so we've, we've set about now, what interests me here is, is, is trying to devise a, uh, a, a, a kind of felicitous process <coughs> from, from architectural creation of this, this minimal gesture um, to create a, a parametric model, so an elastic model that allows the engineers to, to, to feed in as well. So ultimately, you're distributing material in space uh, effectively now. First, we, we modeled it. It was sort of not altogether successful at first, but I, lo I love that uh, finding mastery. Yeah. Now, we, we see it as a, just a series of triangles that are fabricated, but each surface uh, gets, a, gets a depth, and that's the engineering control. So you're, you're creating a structural thickness. We rejected having an internal structure 
uh, and then cladding it. What I wanted was, was really just to use a material that is, is both structure and surface. Uh, so here, just a, a thickening of that triangulation, occasionally webs and wefts inside. So taking it into um, prototyping, so we did a couple of panels for the Biennale, and the development of a, a parametric model, just a, a fairly simple thing. But so you, you can begin to vary the entire object uh, globally, so it's sort of no longer an object, it's sort of the possible variance of an object, as if it's got a sort of genetic code within it, allowing input from engineer and fabricator. So it's a, it's a variable thing, and you, you're not having to redraw every single triangle, it's, it's all automatically updating, uh, which seems to me the most, uh, the most powerful propensity of digital systems for architects, really. Uh, so the prototyping, reasonably successful. We, have, we found that gluing triangles together wasn't particularly good. As the glue goes off, it warps the triangles. So you get this, these tolerance problems. So ultimately, we're going to have to build uh, negatives and fill them. But uh, there's Ed proving it's structurally sound. And these very sort of curious, very pure um, stealth forms that, that emerge. So the exidoi folly has been created as an inflection of the landscape to, to pocket space as a minimal but spatially incisive gesture. We work with five splines, twisting them serially to create notional shelter and orienting, orienting this according to the parameters of exposure, view, traffic, etc. This created a restless paramorph. It's defining exoskeleton, a three-dimensionally articulate model, which could be globally varied in deference to any of the design forces impinging upon it. Ultimately, we have faceted the mollusk form to generate it a structure surface that is a coherent three-dimensional shell. Such context machine, able to inflect according to the influence of a variety of local conditions, also carries the latent capacity to be a structure machine, offering the possibility for highly three-dimensional assemblies. The cutting patterns of the fiberglass triangles are genetically linked to the transmutable paramorph, offering a seamless connection between conceptual design and fabrication process. Bachelard's chapter on nests seems to similarly articulate forms that were pre-digitally imaginary which now merit consideration in the actuality by architects. He muses on the nest as an intricate imprint of the inhabiting body, adjusted continually as a soft cocoon that outlines the aura of movement of the bird's rounded breast. This raises the specter of an environment adapting to our bodies and continually recalibrated to suit the vulnerability of our relation to the environment. Such forms of dry modeling, merging camouflage and comfort, in a density of ambient stuff seems suggested, suggestive of an alloplastic relationship between self and environment, moderated by an endlessly redefined digital matrix. The empty nest, like the shell, carries an unknowing impulsion, a trauma, as if an in interminable and complex three-dimensional weaving had been interrupted. Such forms of absence as images of the function of habitation offer a cultural correlative to the temporal generative processes implicit in digital design. <coughs> now, if we take that forward to uh, a, a fully architectural application, this um, we were asked to design a, an extension to an apartment at the top of this tower down near Tate Modern. Uh, great site, curious building. Um, I mean, it's, it's a perfectly heterogeneous sort of London eclectic context in Foster's Bridge. That's Ogden Moron. You've got 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 90s, um, and and we're sitting atop this. Very, right, very awkward thing. Now he, he owns the top two floors, and he uh, doesn't use the roof terrace. It's always too exposed. So they were looking to uh, to extend across the roof terrace. And the great thing is the views, 360 degree views around London. Uh, St Paul's opposite. There's the Wibbly Wobbly Bridge. Uh, now we began again with, with splines, um, s sketching uh, quite loosely, uh, which seemed appropriate given that it's a, it's a round or oval building. Now I've, I've, I sort of froze that one. We, as, as usual, we're generating many hundreds of, of sketches in a sense, but here I froze it to, to say two things. The, the thermal laws in Britain uh, from the 1970s mean that in an apartment it's difficult to get more than about 40% uh, glazing. Um, you just don't get the U-value through the, through the glass. 
Um, so immediately there's, there's solid, there's got to be solid up there despite the, the desire for a kind of glass bubble. And secondly, again, complex curve glazing just seemed utterly untenable uh, given, given the sort of budgetary constraints. We immediately thought of, of wrapping all, all three sort of floors to make something that was significantly uh, present in the urban, urban scene. So something, something like this, really impossible. There's too much glazing, it's complex curve throughout. Um, but nonetheless, this, the, the idea sort of came of uh, a, spiral, a spiraling form at the top. Uh, we flattened the glass here, but kept the, kept the curvature of panels, and it generates this sort of back to the future, awful 1970s futurism, you know. Um, but nonetheless, that's the sort of form that, that began to... Again, you're, you're looking for idea out of, out of a sampling process, very much like the, the Gateway project. And, and little by little, this, uh, this sort of desire for this spiral crystal emerges. Internally, um, nothing... Uh, it's just an open loft, potentially, perhaps notionally a, a bedroom. But the views out to St. Paul's, extremely important. So this became a sort of idealized envelope. Um, wrapping those floors, creating balconies on the lower floor. We begin to facet it just like the, the sculpture, uh, initially very poorly, but increasingly as a sort of uh, the more and more skillful operation. We imagine that as a, uh, a series of blinds, so it's fiberglass, three-dimensional trusses, blinds um, which react to the, 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 the environment, so it, it becomes... Um, responsive to the environment. And then these first sort of sketches which, which begin to, um, to, to to say something. I mean, you're creating a, a truly three-dimensional space where these are uh, structural elements uh, fabricated in, in fiberglass, glass infill, and then uh, a s series of blinds like a sort of shoal of fish uh, in, inside. And just as the client is sort of falling off his chair, we sort of qualify it in an urban sense. Uh, it's, it's difficult for me to look at the building now without it, strangely. But it begins to, uh, begins to work. And again, not designed as such. It's, a, it's emerged from a, a sampling. And you know, almost inconceivable without um, the, the thought that it could be parametrically modeled such that you control these geometries and allow engineers and fabricators to, to become implicit in these... Uh, in these uh, forms and as, as, a as a spatial quality, you know, filter, filter light, this dramatic three-dimensional space, kind of a delicious thought. So here a dramatically animate space has resulted from a consideration of a range of contextual factors, thermal laws governing the amount of glazing, planning restrictions as to the volume of any extension, structural and constructional factors demanding a rapid and lightweight intervention. These specific constraints are brought into play with the more general contextual concern as to the look of such extension in so prominent a location. Again, such constrained elastic modeling offers the possibility to alter the form actively in response to a variety of practical, legal, political, and aesthetic factors. The complex form deploying three-dimensional structure surfaces announces the possibility of efficiency within an expanded formal register. The structural engineers and fabricators can alter the form and fabrication information automatically updates by virtue of globally constrained modeling. That's a parametric uh, model notion. So all the triangles stick to the spines. The project will be fabricated from fiberglass triangles, glass panes, and, and fabric blinds, the entire surface responding actively to the changing environment as a breathing skin digitally alive. So if our context machine could link the patterns of life to the possibility of a material densification depositing material felicitously in space according to its prescriptive geometries, then we would have a legitimate architecture <coughs> machine. Yet this would describe in a now open-ended, evolutive manner, no longer an architecture but the possibility of an architecture. It would allow explicit and reciprocal experimentation with a range of contextual parameters and permit an assessment of the contextual thickening of a particular act of architecture. If we were to then set this evolutive relational matrix to real-time responsiveness, then one has the possibility of a literally alloplastic architecture, one of materialized reciprocity. This one ventures opens a legitimate contextual debate for a digital age in its insistence that as much as architecture responds to context in the expanded range of digital responsiveness, so architecture creates context. Architecture henceforth becomes tuned 
as an event in the city, and context becomes a play of effects. Our projects introduce parametric propensity and, and develop an alloplastic contextualism. So this last one takes that idea uh, literally um, that architecture is, is nothing uh, other than a play of uh, parametric potentials. This was uh, the project Brett mentioned and probably you all know, the Aegis Hypersurface. It developed as a, an art comp from an art competition for the Birmingham Hippodrome, uh, where this prow that sticks out from the, the front of uh, the newly renovated foyer was to act as a, a site for an interactive art piece or sculpture. Um, that plane actually penetrates into the foyer, so it's an indoor <coughs> outdoor space. And I think they invited four or five artists to, to submit to this competition. Now, coming out of that uh, sort of the programming of parametric uh, modeling that we'd been doing, this, this was a sort of obvious next step, was to make that real time. And we proposed a piece um, uh, where the, the architect, it's just a mute architectural surface, but it, it becomes responsive you know, dynamically uh, to a range of, um, of, of things impinging upon it. Uh, you know, even at the time of the competition, we sort of began to sketch that out. Uh, movement, so it can capture the movement of people and register it real-time in form, background or foreground, so very subtle effects or very dynamic effects. And linked to the auditorium, sounds in the auditorium. Yeah, movement of people, this, this immediate re reciprocity between the body and, and architecture. Um, and the, the problem with proposing ideas like that is occasionally you win the competition, which we, we duly did, and uh, <laughs> which gave me pause. But we, we already had a team of uh, mathematicians, programmers, so that the sort of front end, the, the generative end, was, was I was comfortable with. It, it, was, it was then sort of finding uh, mechanical devices and, and interrogating whether it really was feasible. And the crucial thing became the robotic engineering, and it was finding robotic engineers who who, could, who were willing within our sort of budgetary constraints and limitations to, to try and deploy uh, information at sufficient speeds to be able to control a matrix of notionally 2,000 actuators. Now we went through various, uh, we looked at electronic actuators, pneumatic actuators, hydraulic actuators, came to pneumatics because it's the simple, simplest tried and tested, it's a dumb technology. Uh, and ultimately we w w went through a, a series of prototypes. Now this is the first time we took control of the, the, the computer that we created, uh, which is a, it's a monster. It's a, a cupboard, so two meters by two meters, uh, feeding this, this thing. It's about 550 kilos, this computer turned up from Australia. Um, and I show that clip be, not because it's, uh, the, the, the effects pleased anyone. They, the, they were kind of catastrophically staccato, but it, it shows that the piston is being stopped in space discreetly. Um, which means the information is, is coming at speeds that are opening and closing the valve yeah, uh, sufficiently quick that you can, you can, you can control movement. Um, we then tried the pneumatics. This is the first, first time we put the pneumatics to the test. <laughs> I just lost it. This thing thrashed itself to death in about 20 seconds. It broke all the welds on the frame and just collapsed in a heap. And me, <laughs> and me, me next to it. Yeah. Um, but that, uh, that's running at about seven bar. But, so you've got this, this incredibly powerful information system which is feeding information. I think we've slowed it down to 16 thousandths. So every piston is being refreshed every 16 thousandths of a second. Uh, very powerful pneumatic system. And it's been through lots of empirical testing just trying to balance these two systems. So it's still staccato at that point. And developing this, this surface in particular has, has been the, the crucial thing to develop. It's not working elastically. It's a, sort of deep, uh, it's a deep sponge surface where it's a series of squids on the end of the pistons. We call them squids. They're literally like squids. And the legs are opening and closing. So it's, it's just uh, displacing geometrically. But bit by bit, we, um, we tease out of this, this dumb machine uh, its kind of G-spot. Um, where you, begi you begin to get the, pre the pressure and information sort of flowing. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. 
Well, it, it, uh, it's very, very much. It's much more and more hilarious, really. Now, because it's um, because we're feeding information about every uh, well, so so quickly, we can trigger adjacent pistons uh, fairly rapidly, and um, so you can get we said it would animate the foyer, but actually it's a it's a low frequency weapon train one bar. So it, that becomes essential when you see see the range of effects that we begin to put on that that speed of information seems seems sort of crucial. So this, uh, behind the scenes, we're, we're developing a sort of mathematical puddle machine where you can play with your, your mouse and begin to create things and get this instant uh, reciprocal movement, which is by that stage fairly good. This is about prototype four. So at that point, we got a, we found a, a German sponsor who was very excited and um, multiplied the budget by ten. <laughs> So we could put ten of these things together, and we decamped to a little village called Sindelfingen in somewhere in Bavaria. And late one night, we s we, we plugged all this thing. And this is the first wave we put in this, this thing, which was uh, an astonishing moment. And now, essentially, you sort of prove concept that you're controlling 560 points, essentially in a coordinated fashion. And we just played with it. We danced with it. An extraordinary moment, really. And immediately we, we begin playing music to it, uh, writing text on it, because it's implicit within a digital system. I mean, very inexpertly, but um, kind of drunkenly by this stage, actually. As we take, take it forward to, to CBIT, um, again, I mean, it's still very much a prototype. It's running. Uh, pressure, but we begin to, uh, to get the kind of forward effects that we've uh, dreamed of in the, in the graphics program in front. Uh, we're simply putting light on it here, which is changing the color so it hallucinates. Uh, largely here just running mathematical patterns. Um, mathematics so that you really do get a control of the pitch and uh, you can produce coordinated effects. And the, the, uh, the effect of it was astonishing. I mean, the Hewlett Packard on the next stand tried to close us down because they didn't have anyone on their stand, which was quite gratifying. It, it really sort of captured people's imagination. Now, it became really compelling when we began to get uh, interactivity, so we got video cameras to linked to the deployment of algorithms. And it was at that moment everybody started running around with crisscross patterns, which is fun. Um, video grayscale mapping, so that this is the video cameras sort of there, which is just watching this guy's hands. And the, the power of it to be linked physically, and everything's linked to everything, as you physically move in the space, so, so the space comes into being, it's a decorative patterns emerge from your, your movement. Like, you know, as, I, as I say, I don't, we're not creating an architecture here, we're creating the possibility of an architecture. It is nothing except the interaction of you and it. Um, we're creating the parameters that, that inform it, perhaps. The most interesting was the putting microphones, and we got three microphones, and we found a, a white German rapper from Sheffield, as you do, uh, who invented a song, Wicked Wall, which he sang for about four hours. <laughs> Well, that's his, his voice intersecting the phone. And it's a synesthetic transfer from one medium to another, from voice to to, uh, to physical form. And I, th I think the important thing is, is really you're, begin you're beginning to suggest, uh, and it's, it's, very, it's just one algorithm repeated three times, so it's just a concentric circle. I and mean, then ultimately you'll have 500 in a six sided space and you're howling at it. Um, and I think you've really sort of crossed a threshold into a, into a new medium. Um, the most fascinating part for me was, was that sort of interface of information and, and physicality, which is, I suppose is my fascination uh, in all these projects. It's a, it's a beautiful space. And you, you know that information is coursing sort of 100 times faster than anything you're seeing, which is the key to the whole, uh, the whole effect. Of course, just just at the threshold of the text. It's 
So the Aegis hypersurface links the interactive potential of digital systems to a matrix of actuators, illustrating an evident next step of digital systems in allowing physically interactive environments. Such literal malleability of form, which can react to any environmental input, you know, whether of ambient systems or bodily activity, suggests entirely new genres of contextual thought, where the act of architecture is an actively responsive one. The architect no longer designs architecture as a formal fixity, but orchestrates a matrix of responsive interfaces that offer a, a physical reciprocity to and of events. Aegis is the ultimate parametric model, perhaps, where a physical environment may be varied real-time according to a matrix of input and output thresholds devised by the system architect. Any digital input can be sampled to create an output and effect, which requires that the architect be highly explicit about the operations of such context machine. Aegis feeds off the context and alters that context in a web of alloplastic variability, marking a congenital breach of determinate contextual notions. We announce henceforth that context is in play. The nest for Bachelard is a primal formlessness that is balanced between a physical insecurity and a daydream of repose. He inquires as to the basic instinct that diligently builds in spite of such precarious duality and concludes that the nest constitutes an essential optimism, the origin of confidence in the world. Speculation in the digital medium, you know, an evolutionary architecture, might then be considered a form of digital nesting, expressive of a force of renewal of cultural imagination. But most crucial will be the extent to which it articulates the poetics of a radically expanded formal possibility in attaining an image adequate for habitation of a displaced, displaced spatial sense. Thank you. Two questions, because it's my birthday. <laughs> Preferably none. This one. Okay. Hey. Mark, yeah. Um, well, actually, an observation first, and a question. Um, the observation is: is uh, Have you read Stephen Wolfram's *A New Kind of Science*? Because there's some work there, which is I mean, when you're talking about Bachelard and shells, and, and uh, Wolfram has been exploring how you can look at cellular automata and start generating some of the, some of the patterning that kind of very com comes very close to the patterning on, on shells. It, I know that Carl Chu has been using it in his studio in, in Colombia, but it may be interesting just to explore that as a possibility. But my question really is, um, it's in a sense there, there are like two operations that are going on. One is to do with sort of a kind of structural um, post-Gaudian sort of thing, and then the, the, the next exploration of, of patterning in some sense. Um, and I'm wondering whether they've ever attempted to try and, and link the two. Um, Greg talks sometimes, I'm not sure Greg's book demonstrates this, but how, how you know, an animal, the patterning on an animal might um, respond in some way to the structural, um, uh, to the structure beneath, um, the armature of the, of the bones and what have you. Um, and whether one might begin to sort of explore that as a, as a possibility where you're, 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 you're folding that opposition between structure and ornament into one another so the structure yeah. becomes ornamental and the ornament becomes structural in a way. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it, all right. <laughs> said better than I could. First, uh, happy birthday to you. Thank you. And second is, uh, just a simple question is, uh, I mean, the projects are really marvelous, but the question for me is, what do you, to get such clients, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a dream for all of us as architects to, to build this stuff, but it's, it's true. how we get these clients? All my clients have been wonderful. <laughs> it's very true. There's, there's, there's some here, so uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, um, they haven't been one of them. The Blue Gallery clients were a disaster, uh, ab absolute disaster. And they, they, they asked us to do exactly what we did, and then they, they couldn't, couldn't, you know, couldn't follow through with it. And they, they bottled, bottled in. It was, it was awful. Um, I think. I, I don't have any choice. You, you know, every time you get a client, you're you're trying trying to listen to what it is they want. You're using whatever capacity you've you've gained over 20 years or whatever it is, and then dream just beyond their expectations. And it, it worked very well in the apartment, but I think that was that was a very special client. He's a he's a film producer, and he's he's used to working with 
lots of creative directors. He has sort of ten directors under his his aegis, and I think he uh, he he saw he, he teased out the best of of a relationship. I won't, won't say it wasn't fraught at times, but it was it was a very special relationship. But I think I, typically you're you're um, all of this is done. I've never said no to a client. You know, I've never said no to anything actually, because you're you're desperately trying to get the next thing, and you're you're simply taking each opportunity and trying to push it. And often we're pushing too far. I mean, we're sort of taking these little opportunities and putting them through the roof. The Blue Gallery was an example. I mean, Lucas's house is an example. Um, but but you you know you're learning as you go, and and uh, uh, and I think I think we're small quite quite obvious. It's quite obvious why we're small, why why these projects are small, because you're almost reinventing, you know, the whole of the construction thing from the bottom up, and you're having having to learn all the responsibilities that. That that takes, and it's it's uh, it's extremely, you know, um, it's, it strains you enormously. Um, but the apartment, in particular, I mean, it, it it reversed all the kind of responsibilities on site. And you become responsible for the plumbing and the electrics, and and you have to get all the electricians on your side and all the plumbers on your side, which they're not used to. They usually just they just want to put this thing in. So we're sort of creeping towards a, sort of saying, well, if this really is going to requalify architecture, um, you know, it's, it really demands a. a I don't know, a very thorough reworking of all the relationships that are there. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know. yeah. Just one, one, more. one more. Then we're drinking. Um, I'd like to know, I'm really, I am really impressed with the, the way you work with movement and form. But one of the things I noticed with the Hippodrome project was you came up with this fabulous structure and uh, the difference between that and the original concept was was a sort of fluidity. I know it's not finished yet, but I have questions about how these projects in general that deal with movement address the issue of sound and fluidity. Mm. Um, what, what, sort of, what are your ideas on that? Um, I mean, there's a, there's a whole history of discourse of movement in architecture which which is curious. I mean, t typically architecture is thought of as frozen, frozen movement. Uh, it has been classic, and I think that reflects the technologies that you've got. Um, I think I'm, I'm more interested in sort of trying to trap the process of coming into being, almost like a geological sense of movement. So it's implicit. There's some sort of uh, thing with it. And Greg, Greg then talked, talks about that uh, somewhat. And I think, okay, yeah, sometimes you do. Sometimes you, you the material. The structure and the, the, everything is working together, and you, you're trapping a delicious new kind of dynamics within within this this materiality. Um, the the hyperscope is obviously literally movement. I mean, it's not an implicit movement; it's a literal movement. And I, I think that's actually much much more difficult to deal with, and it, it has to be teased out. We've been thwarted. You know, we, it hasn't gone forward as we'd we'd hoped, but um, we're working at it. I can't wait to actually get back to it. And I I suspect ag again it. If, if you approach anything like movement literally, it, you kill it, and it's it's got to be um, teased out felicitously. You know? uh, and I, I suspect the, the the greatest effects of of this project will not be in the the obvious approaches to it. It's going to be some somewhere else. And I just say that to the sensor. Um, okay. Thank you, Mark. Thanks Thank very much for the answer. Nice, really fun. That was an inspiration on the train this morning. Yeah. I, I, I know. I've, I've, um, like all architects, you tend to sort of dumb it, dumb it back to what we did this.